Lambrick, welcome. I am so excited to be the one who gets to welcome you here today. My name is Therese. I'm one of the worship leaders here, and I also get to work here. I've been admin director at Lambrick for about three and a half years, and I've also been part of this community for 25 years, more than 25 years. So essentially since I was a baby, <laughs> Seriously though, looking back on those 25 years, it's really um, encouraging to see the many ways that God has blessed us through many different kinds of seasons, uh, including this one. For example, as a community on Halloween, we were able to hold our regular Treat Street event. Although it looked a little different this year, we were able to welcome safely 150 people through our candy doors and we gave out thousands of pieces of candy thoughtfully delivered and donated by you so thank you so much for that and thank you to those of you who were praying for this event and thank you as well to the more than 30 volunteers we had who helped to make that happen now there are still lots of events happening throughout the week even though we aren't meeting in person on sundays so if you'd like to find out ways to connect or get involved please check out our website and if you haven't downloaded the church center app i would really encourage you to do that you can find a link for that on our website landing page as well so now we get to be the community of Lambrick by singing together, by being taught together. Um, before we do that, I'd like to start with some encouragement from Scripture. This is Philippians 2, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation. Look at how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the Anointed One. You are filled to overflowing with His comforting love. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and have felt His tender affection and His mercy. So I'm asking you, my friends, that you be joined together in perfect unity, one heart, one passion, and united in one love. Walk together with one harmonious purpose, and you will fill my heart with unbounded joy. So let's do that together this morning. Welcome. and pray find in me thine all in all cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change spots and melt this heart of stone As Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he was still white as snow stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save 
shall still repeat Cause Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Oh, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. As white as snow. Praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Look at how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the Anointed One. You are filled to overflowing with His comforting love. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and have felt His tender affection and mercy. So I'm asking you, my friends, that you be joined together in perfect unity with one heart, one passion, and united in one love Walk together with one harmonious purpose, and you will fill my heart with unbounded joy. Well, friends, this is Simon Pretty coming to you in voice only. And it is with purpose that I'm doing this because this morning I'm inviting us, as Daniel has invited us recently, to pray with eyes open. And I want to invite you to turn your attention to the screen because as I'm praying, Images will come up on the screen, and I'm hoping that these images will help tether our minds to the prayers that we're bringing to God. So I invite you to pray in your hearts with me, and let's bring these prayers to God together. Let's pray. God, I give you thanks for creation. I'm in awe that you created such beauty out of nothing. And then at the heart of that creation, you made us and we are your most prized possession of all. And God, we see your care and your affection for us in the beauty of what you've created. It is a gift to us. So I pray by your Holy Spirit, you would give us the wisdom to care for this creation as you intended us to care for it. And Lord, I give you thanks for our community, the body of believers who make up Lambert Park Church And God, as imperfect as we are, there is beauty in our mess. You created each one of us. You knit us together in our mother's womb. And our individual worth comes not from what we accomplish, but simply because you are the one who created us and you make good things. So Lord, grant us strength to care for each other well, that the world may know we are yours by how we love each other. 
God, we give you thanks for the many ministries that happen at Lambert Park Church. Uh, I think especially of English language learners, uh, a ministry that is opening the doors to people in our community who don't know who you are. And God, you are removing barriers, even language barriers. So help us to not be barriers or roadblocks in others coming to know who you are through the ministry of Lambert Park Church. We give you thanks for our physical building. What a blessing it is to have a building that we own that we can meet in as a church. Although right now we cannot meet in that building as we once did. But God, we do know that our doors will fling wide again one day soon. And we pray that in the meantime, God, you'd give us creative ways to metaphorically open the doors wide so that all those wanting to journey toward you would find a place to call home and a loving family that would care for them. And God, we now turn our hearts and minds to Rwanda, where Kelly and Cello, our dear friends and missionaries, are living and serving and are facing all kinds of uh, situations that require your, your love and your attention and your provision. So God, we lift up Kelly and Cello to you. And we specifically think of the adoption process that they are presently in the midst of. And God, there's been many challenges and there's been many frustrations, but we do believe that you will bring a swift and beautiful conclusion to this process. And we are so excited for them to welcome Jubilee into their family as soon as possible, God. So we pray for a blessing over that situation. And for all their needs, Lord, would you be today their daily bread? We ask this in Jesus' name. So friends, I invite you now uh, in closing of this community prayer to join with me, still with eyes open, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And together we say, Amen. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over, no, my story's just begun And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does Yeah, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does Shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Arrival's not the end game The journey's where you are And you never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good And failure's never final, when the Father's in the room I say, failure's never final, when the Father's in the room 
shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, ooh you're in the Father's house Ooh, ooh you're in the Father's house Prodigals come home the helpless find hope And love is on the move When the father's in the room And prison doors fling wide The dead come to life And love is on the move When the father's in the room And miracles take place The cynical find faith And love is breaking through when the father's in the room, yeah Jericho walls are quaking The strongholds now are shaking And love is breaking through When the father's in the room, yeah And love is breaking through When the father's in the room Shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, ooh you're in the Father's house Ooh, ooh you're in the Father's come home the helpless find hope and love is on the move when the father's in the room and prison doors fling wide the dead come to life cause love is on the move when the father's in the room come on and miracles take place the cynical find faith and love is breaking through when the father's in the room, yeah. And Jericho walls are quaking, the strongholds now are shaking. And love is breaking through when the father's in the room, yeah. And love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's Well, good morning, Lambrick. It's good to be with you again this Sunday. Although I got to be honest, I heard uh, the the Prime Minister's 
um, comment this week uh, about the pandemic sucking. And I just, I felt this sense of, oh my gosh, it's been so long since we've been together and I miss us coming together so much. And I'm sure, I'm sure many of you do um, in all sorts of ways, right? And that's just where we are and it's worth just saying and it feels like it's gonna be a long time uh, before we experience something like that again. I'm sure all of us um, watch a TV show or something like that, and we see people together, gathered you know, for a birthday party or whatever, and you think, oh my gosh, I long for that. So anyways, um, miss you guys. So I'm glad that in Christ we are bound together, and we are brothers and sisters. And I, even this morning, I see you know a, a post on social media about one of our people um, and uh, in a place of need, and uh, in my heart, goes there, right? And I want to pray. And I hope that we are continuing to lean in and come alongside and support one another, even at a distance, to be the body of Christ, to be a community that shows up in prayer and support wherever we can. So so yeah, our hearts are with you and uh, we're in this together. And, and we say these words, a uh, well-known refrain, right? The Lord be with you and you say back and also with you. So can I, can I say that for us today? Today, hear it from me. The Lord be with you. I'll receive that from those of you that said it, and also with you. We're in this together. All right, this morning, I want us to start, um, I want to invite us to, for a moment, to reflect at the start on the familiar Old Testament story of Samuel as a young boy who's serving as an apprentice to Eli the priest. This is one of those classic hearing God stories. We find the passage in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Um, I'll let you read it yourself, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 and beyond. And it's that moment where God calls to Samuel in the night, but he doesn't realize it. Um, until the third time, um, each time he thinks Eli is calling him, and he goes to Eli, and Eli says, I didn't call you, go back to bed. And, and the third time it happens, um, Eli is finally clued in, and he says to Samuel, that, that's God calling. That voice you're hearing is God's voice. And he directs him to respond, speak, for your servant is listening. So 1 Samuel chapter 3. I mentioned this story at the outset today because I think it beautifully highlights the heart of why we're doing this study this fall on hearing God's voice, and not simply because it is yet another passage that Um, affirms that our God is a God who speaks. But because of the way, as Samuel's experience testifies, because of the way that it reminds us or alerts us that hearing and recognizing God's voice is not always obvious, undeniable, self-evident. When we think of hearing God's voice, we often imagine an earth-shaking, time-stands-still, James Earl Jones-esque voice like thunder from the heavens, which sometimes it is, though not often. And I want to say that. It's never been that in my experience, and often isn't that as we listen to the stories of others, both in Scripture and in history. For most of us, our experience of hearing God's voice is much more like that of young Samuel in 1 Samuel 3. It's something that requires some learning, some mentoring, some help. Samuel needed Eli in his life to help him recognize when that God was speaking and when God was speaking and how to listen. And my hope and prayer is that this series of Sundays this fall on hearing God's voice and the conversations it generates among us will prove to be something of an Eli moment for you in this season of your life, that God would use all of this to awaken more and more of us to God's speaking voice. And and this would serve as an invitation for us to learn to listen and respond as Samuel learned to hear and listen and respond to God who speaks. So with that, Let's turn to God in prayer. 
living God, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gospel that we have sung and declared already together. The gospel that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ today across this city, across wherever we are, and across the diversity of our situations right now. We come together because of you, because of your mercy and grace, because of what you have done for us, God, in Christ. So we bow before you with thankfulness today. In the midst of all of our need, we come with thankfulness for who you are, for how you have let us know you in Christ by the Spirit and through your word. Thank you for those that have already led us in prayer today, in song, welcomed us into your presence and fellowship today. And we ask God as we turn our attention again to this conversation, to this reality of your being a God who speaks and our invitation to listen. God, we ask again, would you teach us, Lord, to listen? We long to hear your voice and we confess with hope today that it, that it is our hope that you want us to hear your voice, that it's by your voice that we come alive and live and breathe and have our being that we live by the word of God. So come today again and teach us, Lord, as we live in this very practical series rather than in a book, but in a a reality of a core practice. God, would you teach us together how to listen for your voice and would you grant us the grace, God, of finding ourselves addressed by you. Open our ears and Lord, in your mercy, speak to us today. Amen. All right, so come again uh, to one of the core texts. Let's come again to one of the core texts of our study. Jesus' words in, to the disciples in John 10, verse 27. My sheep, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. John 10. Uh, there Jesus, in multiple ways, just drills down this core reality. That he is our shepherd, that we are his sheep, and that our life with him is bound up in listening for hearing and following his voice. According to Jesus, this is basic Christianity. This is essential to life with God. And as we talked about over the weeks, not only that, but this is something we all long for, deep in our souls. As Gordon Smith has said, which I've referenced once before, he says, to know and hear the voice of Jesus is one of the greatest hungers of our lives. So over the weeks, having laid some groundwork um, about the reality of our God who speaks and the choice we all have, the battle we face and the choice we have to, to choose to listen to and follow God's voice rather than our own, last Sunday, Daniel invited us to consider Jesus as the living example of the listening life. Jesus is the embodied um, listening 101 story for us, whose life was shaped and defined by a living attentiveness and responsiveness to God's voice uh, for the good of the world, right? It is impossible to to follow Jesus, to pay attention to Jesus and not notice this about his life he lived in accordance to, attentive to, in response to the voice of God. This morning, I want to pick up where Daniel left off by beginning to explore more of how, now, how we hear God's voice. How can we learn to know and hear God's voice? Yes, the Bible tells us that God is a God who speaks, but how do we learn to hear and know God's voice? Well, not surprisingly, the starting point and foundation to knowing and hearing God's voice is the Bible itself, the very source that reveals to us that our God is a God who speaks. As many have said before, and here again, I'm I'm quoting Gordon Smith, a professor of mine in grad studies. He, he, He wrote, he said, we cannot know the voice of Jesus unless we are men and women of scripture. Let me read that again. He said, we cannot know the voice of Jesus unless we are men and women of Scripture. Or to put it another way, if we want to be women and men who hear and discern God's voice in our lives, 
and the lives of others. We need to be listening to God in Scripture. We need to have our minds continually renewed by and alive with God's revelation in Scripture. It's common these days, and I'm sure you know this, you've heard this, you've said it. When we get talking about wanting to hear God's voice, for our first response to be an invitation or attempt to be quiet, to cultivate the quiet, to get away, to be still, which is likely something many of us need to learn, something I need to keep learning in my life. But in and of itself, and I want to make this clear, in and of itself, being quiet doesn't necessarily mean becoming attentive to God's voice. It could just be yet another place or environment where we listen to our own voice or that of others. But if we're hungry to hear God's voice, to hear God's voice, and learn to hear God's voice in our lives today, in the hustle and the quiet, what we need above all is to hear what God has already spoken. Those who willfully neglect Scripture will be significantly disadvantaged in discerning God's voice, which isn't to say that they or we won't hear God's voice, but they or we will not be equipped sufficiently to recognize and discern God's voice. And I hope to make that really clear for us today. The Bible plays an essential and ongoing role in knowing and hearing and discerning God's voice in our lives. But before we go any further, I need to pause here. We need to pause here, and I need to acknowledge two two things, two yeah buts that I suspect some of you are thinking. Maybe a minute ago, when I mentioned the foundation is the Bible, you just started dialing out. So first, it's that, that I know that in saying this, some of you have already, are already tempted to dial out because you have read the Bible for years. You've heard a bazillion sermons, maybe many of mine, and you still feel that you don't know how to hear and discern God's voice. Most Christians know, confess, that reading the Bible is an essential Christian practice. But just because we know this, and maybe even do it, doesn't mean that we understand the role the Bible is supposed to play in our lives. I want to say that again. Just because we know that reading the Bible is an essential Christian practice, just because we know this and maybe even do it, doesn't mean we understand the role the Bible is supposed to play in our lives. So so what is the role the Bible is supposed to play in our lives? How are we to engage the Bible, to read it? And if it is so important, why does reading the Bible often not affect us in the way we think it should. Do you know anyone who ever gets frustrated with reading the same story again and again and is tempted to shelf it and just read something else about God, maybe, but not the Bible? Because it it doesn't seem to be doing what we think it's supposed to do. It doesn't seem to be transforming us or resulting in any sort of significant spiritual revelation. I suspect you do, right? You smile as I say it because you know it's been you. It's been me. I, I know few of us would say that we expect to get a warm spiritual buzz every time we read the Bible, but don't we sometimes get frustrated that it doesn't happen a little more often, right? Isn't that one of the reasons we, some of us, give up, have given up reading our Bibles or are tempted to often? Or maybe that's why some of us simply are never drawn to it. All that to say, I think we need to revisit the matter of the Bible's role in our lives and why it's important. And I'm convinced of this because I've seen in my own life how easily I can practice the right discipline with the wrong goal in mind, and the result is only, or most often, frustration. It's happened to me so many times, and I know I'm not alone. Second, with that, we need to also acknowledge that God's voice is not limited to the words of Scripture. And before anyone calls me out for heresy, stick with me because this is what the Bible itself teaches. 
God's voice is not limited to the words of Scripture. The, the Spirit of God can and does graciously speak to us through a multitude of means. The Bible itself describes a vast array of means through which God has spoken at different times to different men and women through dreams and visions. We're about to um, arc towards Christmas, right? And the Advent stories are all stories of God speaking to men and women through dreams and visions, through angels, through friends and strangers, through prophets and pastors, through pagans, through Holy Scripture, through donkeys, through creation, through redemption, through the witness of people's faith and of their failure, and through a still small voice in the soul of a person. God's voice is not limited to the words of Scripture. The Spirit of God can and does graciously speak to us through virtually anything, however. And this is a, a key however. This is vital for us to grasp today. We need to understand that it is primarily through the Bible that we are able to come to know God and by this to cultivate the capacity to know and discern God's voice today. So that when God speaks to us through whatever means God chooses, we can and will be able to know that it is, in fact, God speaking. Are you tracking with me? The Bible is the means through which our soul's ear is trained to recognize God's voice. This is core to the purpose of the Bible. It's one of the core reasons that God has given us the Bible, that through it, through reading, hearing, studying, meditating on it, we would come to know God, right? Not just the Bible. That we would come to know God, to know the God who speaks today, to know what God is like, to know God's character, to know what God cares about, to know what God is up to and seeking in our world in every day. And as we do this, to develop and sustain the capacity to know and discern God's voice in this moment, in our lives, and in our world. Think about this with me, and I, I'm, I'm sure I've used this analogy before, but it's worth repeating. Imagine you have two friends named John. I suspect most of us have know at least two people named John. Maybe different spellings, but it sounds the same, right? And you walk into a conversation about one of your friends named John, how would you know which John they're talking about, right? You can think of two people, totally different people. How would you know which John they're talking about? Well, two ways, right? One, you could just ask them, hey, which John are you talking about? And hopefully they tell you. Or you could listen a bit. And likely you will start to notice things, to hear things that tell you which John they're on about, right? The more you get to know someone, the more you know and are able to recognize their ways, their words, their mannerisms, their influence, their personality, their passions, right? Maybe they mentioned something John said, like uh, about the school of hard knocks or his son's recent pandemic wedding, and you instantly know, oh, it's John DeYoung. That's John DeYoung. You don't have to say it out loud. You just know. You settle into the story. You enter into the conversation about John. Or they describe something John did paddleboarding after work or hunting for some new hot sauce and instantly you know, oh, that's my brother, John. That's vintage John Anderson, right? Before texting and call display, this was a skill uh, everyone had to cultivate for the sake of maintaining relationships, right? You don't want your brother to call you or your sister or your mom and to be 10 minutes in, still not know who's on the call, right? It, you meet someone new, and for the first while, whenever they'd call you, you didn't know who it was until they explicitly told you. But over time, as you got to know them, you'd begin to know it was them because you'd come to know the sound of their voice, or you've come to know the way they addressed you. They didn't say their own name, but they said your name in a way that clued, oh, that's, that's them, or maybe the way they introduced 
themselves or maybe how they breathe or something. I don't know. But it happens, right? We, we know this. As we come to know someone, uh, we start to recognize their voice as we come to know them. Um, over the years, I've had to laugh as I've realized that I can, often, I can often tell who it is that my wife, Janet, is on the phone with simply by listening to the change in Janet's voice. And especially if it's one of her friends from the South, from Oklahoma, Alabama, uh, or Texas. And specifically, I'm thinking of Candace, Candy, and Shelly, three very different but equally loved Southern bells in Janet's life. Janet instantly starts talking with her own Southern drawl, and I know she's talking to one of them. This is um, not, not necessarily just unique of Janet. Uh, this is a normal re- relational thing, isn't it? It's a learned skill, not mimicking the accent of another's, but becoming familiar to the tone of another. I was out paddleboarding this summer uh, with a, a friend in the church um, who's just exploring their way towards faith in Jesus. And he asked me, How do you, what does it mean to hear God's voice? How do we hear God's voice? And, and we talked about this, how, how we come to recognize the quality of someone's voice as we build a relationship with them, as we walk with them, as we do life with them, as we read God's word. Uh, over time, as we interact with someone, we begin to develop this familiarity to their voice and their ways. Dallas Willard, in his book on hearing God's voice, I simply called that, I think, Hearing God, a great book, he breaks this down to three things. He, he says that we cultivate a familiarity to the way someone speaks, a certain quality or impact. Second, we cultivate a familiarity to the spirit in which they speak, so a certain spirit or heart that we hear, that we recognize, And third, we cultivate a familiarity to the kinds of things that they say or talk about, so a certain content. And this is core to coming to know and discern God's voice in our lives. By attending to how God has revealed himself in the past, we develop the capacity to recognize God's voice. And the primary way we do this The primary way we develop this familiarity to God's voice is by listening to what God has already said to us. By attending to God's voice in Scripture, the written record of God's revelation in history. Now, as I said before, God's voice is not limited to the words of Scripture. He can speak to us through anything he chooses. But as Gordon Smith has said, we cannot and will not develop our intuitive capacity to recognize God's voice unless we are women and men who are immersed in Scripture so that the contours of our hearts and minds are ordered and enabled by the Word. Which brings us back to the very purpose of the Bible in our lives. God's goal in giving us the Bible is not primarily so that we would come to know the Bible, but that through Scripture, through, through the biblical record, we would come to know God himself. Whenever I meet someone who expresses an interest in Christian leadership or pastoral ministry, my greatest interest is not simply whether they can quote for me chapter and verse, though I want to see and know that they are devoted to God's word, but my concern, my deeper question is whether their knowledge of Scripture has led them to a living knowledge of God, a life-shaping relationship with the living God who is revealed in Scripture and ultimately is alive in Christ by the Spirit. Because too often we approach the Bible as an end in itself. Too often I've heard people say, I've heard myself say, oh, I know that story, right? It's, maybe it's Sunday morning and, and the sermon begins and we go, oh, oh I know this story, heard it read it, studied it for me, preached it before. And with that, we turn the page or our heart turns the page. We look for something else, a different book. We stop listening. But over the years, I've been challenged, confronted, invited to realize that knowing the stories isn't the goal, isn't the end. The issue isn't, do you know the story or the stories, but do you know the God who is revealing himself through the story? 
I remember a few years back, um, someone telling me that they weren't going to church anymore, that they'd grown up with their dad as the preacher, and he'd been good and great even, um, but, but really they'd heard it all by now. What more could they learn? And I remember thinking, I think you've missed the point of all those sermons and all those stories. The reality is if we think we know God and that knowledge has left us with no hunger for more, I would dare to say we know very little of God because true knowledge of God will make us hungry for more, hungry for more of God. But we do this. We, so often we approach the Bible or listen to a sermon as an end in itself. Yeah, heard that one before. Oh, that was, that was good, good sermon. You know, studied that book last year. Oh, I think I read Romans in grade 12 in a, in a youth group or something. Or we approach the Bible solely to find answers, solely to find principles, application points for our lives, which is not wrong. That's actually good, but it's not the goal. Not the goal of God, not the goal that God has for you and for me. God has given us his word, the written word, not simply so that we can know the word or the words and get things right, but so that we would know God himself, the God who is still alive and still speaking, the God who alone can make us whole and alive with him. Which for me over the years, has shifted my prayer uh, when I come and open God's word, maybe on my own on a Tuesday or a Thursday morning in my living room before the day has begun and the family's gotten going. Or maybe as I turn to scripture to study for the sake of the teaching that I need to bring, I, I, I've thought to, to retrain my heart to say to God as I open God's word, oh God, living God, I need to know you more more than anything else. So in my reading, as I read this story that I've read a million times before, maybe a portion I have not come to before, help me to not just look for application points or sermon ideas or answers to questions, but help me to see you. Help me to know you more. Open my eyes to see who you are. Open my heart, open my ears to hear your revelation that I might know you as you are today and trust and follow you. If we want to be men and women who hear and discern God's voice in our lives and the lives of others, we need to be immersed in Scripture. We need to have our minds continually renewed by and alive with God's revelation in Scripture. Because although God's word is not limited to the words of the Bible. It is primarily through the Bible that God has given us, the written word of God, that we learn to discern the living voice of God today. Now that we could claim to have a corner on knowing the tenor of God's voice, but we come to know God's ways, God's character, God's passions, God's concerns, God's priorities, so that when God speaks through whatever means God chooses, we will be able to say with confidence, I know that voice, that's God speaking to me or to us. I, I trust many of us have stories we could tell. I, I know I can think of many examples in my life, uh, even this week, in little ways. And I think that's worth saying. Most of the stories of my experience of hearing God are in incredibly ordinary moments, not grand uh, James Earl Jones, time stands still, voice from the heavens, thunder moments, but in incredibly ordinary moments as happens in any relationship. Moments that I, like Samuel, have been at times maybe tempted to not even realize were happening, but God has been speaking. But here and there, there's stories that stand out, and I want to share one that I hope I never forget, so maybe it's good for me to keep retelling. And I, and I think I've shared this story once before, um, but it's worth repeating, and I assume you don't remember everything I say. Uh, I think that's true, right? Um, so uh, here goes. Um, if you have heard it before, if it resonates, then I, I, that's great, because I think it's a beautiful story. Um, 
for me, it was, a, it was not, 2008, so about 12 years ago, my son Carter, who's now a strapping teen, 13 years old, was at that moment about a year old. And I was a few years into pastoring my first church. I lived in a townhouse. And on this particular night, I went to bed in a knot. Uh, I was frustrated. I was discouraged about a number of things. And I woke up in the night, not that long after, with my head spinning and my heart spinning, and I couldn't get back to sleep. And then Carter woke up, and I went in to try to help him get back to sleep. But no luck. Uh, we were up for hours together in that dark little um, room that was his. And the whole time, as Carter cried and complained, I was drowning. I can still see myself sitting on the chair on the other side of that room, just feet away from his crib, just drowning in discouragement, negative thoughts about myself, things I'd done and not done, and my struggles to lead my little church forward. And finally, after a long, discouraging while, I whispered to God in desperation, God, I can't handle this. My head is spinning, and I am full of thoughts that I know are not your thoughts. I need to hear your voice. I need to hear your thoughts. I need your perspective on me and this situation and my leadership. And I sat down and stared at Carter. He's in his crib. Um, I've been picking him up and putting him down in intervals, hoping somehow for a breakthrough, but there was no breakthrough. It was just getting worse. And by this point, Carter's crying so hard. He's doing that kind of like freaky breathing crying thing, you know, where he's kind of beyond crying and he can't calm himself down, which is exactly how I felt in my soul in that moment. And in that moment, from the depths of my being, I whispered across the room through the bars of the crib, you're okay, you're okay, Carter. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. I love you. You're okay, Carter. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. I love you. And I knew that in those words, words spoken from my own lips to my son, Carter, God was speaking to me. You're okay. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. I love you. Did God prompt me to say the words? I, I, I don't know. Was God speaking to me? Without a doubt. How did I know? How did I know that it was God and not just my own voice? Well, honestly, a few things assured me. One, the words came with a stunning authority, the authority of Jesus. Up until that moment, I could not stop the negative thoughts and swirl of the voices in my head. But when I heard those words, the storm in me was calmed. E. Stanley Jones, a Methodist missionary to India many years ago, once wrote of the voice of God. He says, the voice of the subconscious argues with you, tries to convince you, but the voice of God does not argue, does not try to convince. It just speaks and its authority is evident as the crowds in the Gospels often observed in Jesus, God's voice is authoritative. And when it commands the storm to be stilled, the storm is still. And in that moment, God's voice stilled the storm in me. I knew I was hearing God's voice because it had a certain authority to it, an impact. And I don't mean to suggest by that that that, that impact is always the calming of the storm, but that impact is a God-given impact. Maybe that impact is, uh, is hope coming to us. Maybe that impact is contrition, a repentant heart. Maybe that impact is insight, a, a new perspective we need. Maybe that impact um, is a sense of knowing that we're loved in the midst of it. I don't know, but that impact is God's, a God-given 
impact, something of God's spirit imparted to us. So first I knew it was God's voice. I sensed it was God's voice because of the authority, the impact of it. Second, I knew that it resonated with the heart of Jesus. It came in love to build me up. Not that God's word to us will not all will not that God's words to us will always be upbeat and positive. God will at times rebuke us, but he will always do so in love. God's word to us will never condemn us, beat us down, maybe lay us low, but to lift us up. And I knew this voice that night speaking to me in love. Third, the words had a certain content to them, right? That I knew from my knowledge of scripture resonated with something God had said so many times before to Moses, to Joshua, to Isaiah, to Jeremiah, to Mary, and many others who found themselves called to tasks way beyond themselves found courage in this one thing, that God's presence would be with them. Again and again, this is what God said to, has said to his people, and this is what would make them sufficient to the task, not their abilities, but his, God's presence with them. You're okay. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. I love you. In that moment, I knew that God had, was, was speaking to me because I knew the sound of his voice. Carter kept crying. The room was still loud. But in my soul, I knew the peace that comes from hearing God's voice. We all have moments where we long to hear God's voice, don't we? Where we plead with God to speak to us. And in response, God's word to us is so often, well then listen, listen. You long to hear my voice, so listen. Come listen to what I have already spoken to you that you might know me and trust what I have said and trust who I am with you and what I'm doing and that you might learn, you might develop the capacity to recognize when I am speaking to you today. But we can't stop there because in the mystery of God's grace, the Bible is not just the record of God's revelation in history, but it is one of the primary means of God's speaking voice to us today. It's not just the record of God's revelation in history, it is the revelation of God through the record of history. You feel the difference of that. It's not just the the record of God speaking in the past, it is the revelation of God's, of God through the record of history. It's not just an essential tool for training our soul's ear, but through the Bible, God continues in grace to speak to us. I wonder how many of us, if I asked you about your experience of hearing God's voice, maybe you've been asked this in recent days, and and your gut response, your quick response is, well, I don't think I've ever really heard God's voice. Maybe you're thinking about a James Earl Jones sort of moment, right? And yet I wonder how many of us, if asked, if you've ever found yourself sitting under the preaching of God's word spoken to in the reality of your life, found God's word preached or taught or communicated in a way that it has spoken something to you very personally, to your life, to your soul, to the questions that you're grappling with, Have you ever found God using a portion of scripture to teach you, to rebuke you, to correct you, to train you in righteousness, as 2 Timothy says? I suspect most of us would say, yeah, yeah, that's happened. Not as much as I'd like, but probably more often than I realize. And I say this with confidence about you because so many of you at so many times have come to me after a Sunday morning not just with the typical, hey, hey, that was good, thanks, Scott, but with that humble, head-bowed, extended hand, 
moment when you lean in and say something of, thank you, I, I needed that today. You have, you have no idea. That was, that was for me today. I don't know whatever else got out of that, but that was for me today. And in that moment, we need to add the words, I heard God speaking to me today, because that's what's happening, right? And I say this too because I've experienced it so many times. Not as much through preaching these days, because I'm often the one preaching, though sometimes God speaks to me through my own preaching. Um, But early on a Tuesday morning or a Thursday morning, as I sit with God and hopefully a good cup of coffee, meditating on a short passage of Scripture, uh, writing it out in my journal or pouring over it, a particular piece of it, where God is revealing himself in this story, this text, this law, whatever, and listening as I study God's word for us, for what God wants to say to us here and there, not always, but more often than I often realize or say. Through God's ancient words, I find myself addressed by a living voice in love. God inviting me in some way to know who he is in the midst of who I am or to know something about myself that I didn't know or don't want to acknowledge to understand something of God's invitation for me today. Hearing God's voice, God's living voice through God's ancient word and words, which is what scripture, what God through scripture says of scripture, right? 2 Timothy 3.16, this is a verse, a familiar text. I've recently referenced it and I hope to do it Many times, I think it's so important. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, a young pastor who needs confidence as he teaches his people, he says, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I love the present tenseness, (laughs) the present tense reality of this word about scripture. Old and New Testament, which is why I mention it often. According to God, all scripture is God-breathed, not just was, but is, which means God continues to inspire us through his word. God continues to inspire the word that was preached so long ago, spoken so long ago, recorded so long ago, that through it, we would hear God's voice again And again, in our day, God continues to breathe new life into us through his ancient word. All scripture is God breathed. So not only will reading the Bible regularly enable us to cultivate an ear for God's voice, but through scripture, through the Bible itself, God continues to speak to us today. The Spirit of God continues to speak to us through the words God spoke so long ago. Two weeks from now, I'm excited to have uh, Tim McCarthy, one of my close, closest friends and a pastor on the mainland, speak about the practice of reading the Bible on a regular basis, the practice of reading the Bible in the midst of a busy life. And I know this will be hugely helpful for us. Um, but today, I want to close with, with some words from A.W. Tozer. I referenced uh, Tozer a few weeks back, uh, spoken more than half a century ago in Tozer's classic work, The Pursuit of God. He writes, he says, I believe that much of our spiritual deadness is due to a wrong conception and a wrong feeling for the scriptures of truth. A silent God suddenly began to speak in a book, And when the book was finished, lapsed back into silence again forever. Now we read the book as a record of what God said when he was for a brief time in a speaking mood. With notions like that in our heads, how can we believe? The facts are that God is not silent, has never been silent. It is the nature of God to speak. The second person of the Holy Trinity is called the Word. 
The Bible is the inevitable outcome of God's continuous speech. A new world will arise out of the religious mists when we approach our Bible with the understanding and and conviction that it is not a book which was once spoken, but a book which is now speaking. And if pressed, I suspect Tozer would clarify that what he means there is not just a book that is now speaking, but a book through which God continues to speak, through which God is still speaking and does to those who will learn to listen in humility and faith. Friends, if we long to know and hear God's voice in our lives in these days, we must follow the Spirit's leading to turn our eyes, our heart, our mind, our ears to God's word in Scripture, to seek to become men and women who live with the words and stories of Scripture alive in our hearts and minds, to hear God's voice in Scripture, and through this, listening to God's word, to come to know God and cultivate the capacity to discern his living voice today. Let's pray. Again, I just want to remind us, in two weeks, um, Tim McCarthy is going to pick up, really, where I'm leaving off here and talk about this in a personal way, what it looks like to live with a rhythm of regular Bible reading, what that could look like maybe in your life, and I hope you'll lean in. Next week, we've got something special happening that's a bit of a step off this, but also related to hearing God's voice. So just invite us to keep leaning in, asking God to teach us to listen, and turning our heart, choosing to listen. Let's pray. Oh, living God, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, you are speaking, revealing God. You who by your word have spoken the world into life and by your word sustain all things today and by your word allow us to know you and draw us into your life. Oh Lord God, Forgive us for the ways that we have cried out to the heavens, asked you to speak, but have not listened uh, to your revelation in Scripture, have turned away from your voice that you have already given to us, placed in our hands, especially in a part of the world like this, where we have such easy access to the written word and to you, God, as we all do by your grace. And so we ask, God, that you would renew, turn our hearts, uh, maybe lead us in a, a journey of repentance to come again to your word, not just to read, but to listen, God, for your voice as we read. God, we ask that you would teach us afresh how to come and listen for your voice and your word. And God, we ask in your grace, that you would help us, lead us as a community of brothers and sisters, um, as we seek you and as we seek you together, God, would you use our shared life to help us cultivate confidence um, in, in knowing what you're like and in that, how to hear your voice, where you are speaking. God, I ask for my brothers and sisters and for myself. I, I feel like probably at times I'm still young Samuel and you are speaking to me God, I feel it in these days. There's things where I so need to hear your voice, where life feels silent, the darkness so quiet, and my voice so loud, and God, I need to hear your voice. And so I ask, God, that you would use whatever means you want, and that you would lead us to be a community of Samuels and Eli's, Lord, that we would by your grace be, you would provide for us and lead us at times to be for others. And Eli, someone who helps another recognize where God is speaking and helps us pay attention. And in this, God, you would give us the 
humility of Samuel to receive that caring, loving counsel and turn our ear to you with hope and expectation and the humility of a response of faith, Lord. So we thank you again for binding us together for this opportunity for us to be in this conversation in these days, even at a distance, God. We confess together there are, there's little to nothing we long for and need as much as to hear your voice. Yours are the words that give life. So teach us, Lord, to listen and speak. Your servants are listening. Amen. All right, let's just continue in prayer as we sing. Let's turn our heart to God who receives people like us, all the poor and powerless. See 
Go on and tell it to the mouth